Right, well, this is coming off for a start. Uh, it's quite enough of that. And uh, just to point out, I didn't make my own Lego classicist figure. Uh, that was actually made by uh, the Lego classicism group. And today, of all days, I don't think David knows this, is International Lego Classicism's Day. <laughs> Check it out. Twitter hashtag ILCD2019. What a better day could there possibly be to have an inaugural. Um, First off, uh, my huge thanks for those introductions uh, from Gwen and uh, from David, but also to Wahir and to the Department of Classics for helping make this event possible this evening, uh, and particularly to Paul Grigsby and to the undergrad classics ambassadors who were welcoming you in at the door. Thank you for your help uh, in making it all happen. And most importantly, of course, to you all for coming. Uh, uh, it is a, a huge privilege and a pleasure to have a chance to talk to you uh, for exactly 40 minutes, I promise. <laughs> Uh, uh, about some of the things that I'm passionate about. Now, this is Sparta. When we were deciding on the title for this lecture and then thinking what should be the RSVP address, and we had a bright idea, why don't we get IT to set up a this is Sparta at worry.ac.uk email address? And our departmental administrator went off to apply for that address to IT services, and it came back a couple of days later uh, with the message, we have set up the following email address, I am Sparta at warwick.ac.uk. <laughs> now, I'm not sure whether that tells us more about our departmental administrator, uh, about themselves or what they think of me. I'm not quite sure which one to take it. But if any of you fancy an email change, I am Sparta at warwick.ac.uk is free and available. <laughs> I'm thinking vice chancellor, possibly a good, a good option. Uh, but this lecture is not actually going to be about Sparta at all. And I'm sorry to disappoint those who I know who were mugging up on Sparta uh, earlier in the day. Rather, it's, I'm starting with this, and with this image in particular, because rightly or wrongly, and Iran did make an official complaint about the representation of ancient Persia in this film, across the globe, this is Sparta and the 300, one of the most recognized and well-known aspects of the ancient Greek and Roman world. And for me, thinking about how our subject is perceived, understood, and utilized outside the bounds of the university and its academic study is absolutely essential. If we pop over to the US, we can see the impact this film has had. It came out in 2007. 2010, American Spartans, a history of the US Marines, was published. And books about ancient Sparta are on the official reading list for US Marine recruits. In fact, books written by a certain gentleman sitting in the front row. In 2010, I was down in Brazil teaching a course about ancient Greek democracy at a time when, as the Rio police raided the favelas uh, to deal with the drugs trade, they were being lauded in the uh, Brazilian press as Spartan warriors. More worryingly, Classicists the world over, but particularly in the States, are increasingly concerned about the use being made of the ancient Greek and Roman worlds by outright political groups. They are stressing the purity and importance of Western culture civilization. They're using the classics to normalize a spectrum of misogynist, xenophobic, anti-Semitic, homophobic views and ideas. And we've seen recently the launch of this project, the Pharos Project, to document these misrepresentations as a first step towards giving academics a platform to highlight their factual inaccuracy and to refute their employment as support for such views. And that's especially important when groups who espouse these views are now getting official invitations to the White House. But at the same time, politicians of much more mainstream and liberal views have sought also to link our modern political systems back to the famed democracy of ancient Athens, its major figures and ideas. It's no coincidence that Obama's last overseas trip in 2016 was to Greece, where he stood in front of the Parthenon to express his gratitude for what Greece has given humanity. He noted how the flame of democracy has been fanned in centuries since by places such as the United States. The need to respect democracy as he handed over to the democratic choice of President Trump and the need to remember the values of democracy in the coming years, as he put it, we seek to course correct globalization and growing inequality. Yet even this link back to something we might think as straightforward as ancient democracy is not quite 
so straightforward. We think of the fact that ancient Greek, ancient Athenian democracy was based on slavery. We think of the fact that it didn't give women the vote. But we could also look at different ways in which the ancient Athenian democracy demanded so much more of its citizens than we would expect our system and our democracy to demand of us today. And we're going to do that by a little bit of audience participation. <laughs> this is the oath of Demophantos, sworn, by, said, by every Athenian citizen in the aftermath of the brief overthrow of their democracy in 411 before its reassertion in 410. Clear your voices, ladies and gentlemen. We are now going to do this oath together. <laughs> are we ready? I shall kill by word and by deed, by vote and by my own hand, if I can, anyone who overthrows the democracy at Athens. Oh, come on, you lot. You've just overthrown the greatest threat to your political system seen in nearly 100 years. Put your backs into it. Come on, once again. I shall kill by word and by deed and by vote and by my own hand, if I can, anyone who overthrows the democracy at Athens. What have you done? <laughs> what have you just sworn to do? Your parents? You've just sworn to kill them. Your brother, your wife, your son, your daughter. You've sworn to kill them all for democracy. In ancient Athens, nothing came above democracy, your allegiance to democracy. Thank you. On the other side of the world, I've never been more surprised than when I turned up in Beijing airport in June 2018 to be greeted by this photo as one of the first photos you see when you walk in to Beijing airport. In the bottom right, it tells you that this is China's Central Academy of Fine Arts, practicing their best in copying some of the great works of ancient Greek art. Now, this photo is meant to look like it just got snapped at a passing by moment. Note the cunningly located plastic bag. But does any of you know anything about China? Nothing in China is done by chance. This is an incredibly studied and purposeful image meant to greet you as you arrive in China to say, we not only also engage with this material, we can copy it and do it in Western style in the paintings, as well as make it something of our own. Indeed, the top left says, cultural gateway, beautiful Beijing. But if you read the Chinese, it says, cultural gateway to China, beautiful Beijing. China, Chunghua, the middle kingdom, the central kingdom, the center of the world. This is China setting up even ancient Greece as actually something that it incorporates, and that it owns. And this is part of a bigger process currently underway, a desire, uh, particularly from China's perspective, to see the ancient uh, creativity, the ancient achievements uh, of ancient Greece and ancient China as on par with one another, as contributing equally to the greater story of humanity. And what we see in China is not only right now the publication of great works to do with ancient Greek art, we see exchanges between museums, their key cultural pieces are going to Greece and Greece is coming to China. We see direct flights being announced between Athens and Shanghai, Athens and Beijing, all as part of an even bigger project, which is One Belt, One Road, in which the port of Piraeus in modern day Athens is what they call the dragon's head of the One Belt, One Road initiative, linking these two very much in terms of modern politics. And Xi Jinping, when he was addressing the party congress in 2017, talking about the four traps China must avoid falling into, two of those had names attributed to the ancient world, particularly the ancient Greeks and Romans, the Thucydides trap and the Tacitus trap which they may have even invented themselves because no one's here has heard of the Tacitus trap. <laughs> From South America to the US to China and everywhere in between, we can see ancient Greek exemplar, and we could do this game for ancient Roman exemplar as well, being called on to support, encourage, and inspire a kaleidoscope 
of viewpoints and ideals which may or may not correspond to ancient realities, as well as being employed as important pieces in the 21st century chess game of global power and influence. Now, firstly, this should make us want to dispense with one of the greatest misnomers when it comes to the study of the ancient world, that it's the study of a subject which is no longer relevant. I hope we can ban that from our minds, and you have my free permission to strike anyone who ever says it to you. <laughs> but secondly, it should make the classical community even more aware of the ways in which our study, our ideas, and our voices matter. And it should also remind us how much we too are not unaffected by some of the wider trends and votes just before. And this was brought home especially, I think, to classicists after the latest US classics conference in January 2019, in which a black tenured professor was subjected to blatantly racist comment by another academic in a Q&A panel. As we seek to engage with how the ancient world is being used and abused in the wider world, it's never been more important for us to also strive to improve attitudes within our own community and to insist on the highest standards of academic ob objectivity and rigor in our own discussions. But thirdly, and more positively, I also believe that an understanding of the public perception of and engagement with the ancient societies we study, both its positives and its negatives, can be an important inspiration for how we move to study it and communicate it now and in the future. So for me, in my own research, this has nowhere been more apparent than in the need demonstrated by the modern global reach of classics we just saw to break through the boundaries of the discipline itself and to situate the ancient Greeks and Romans within the wider ancient world of which they were a part. And David was alluding to this earlier. This is the problem. Classicists, we see Rome in every direction. Go to any good bookshop, look at the classic shelves, and you'll see any number of books published by classicists where the title is X or Y theme in the ancient world. But what we actually mean by that is the Mediterranean world. We have bought into the lie somehow that when we're talking about the ancient world, or we're talking about the Mediterranean world rather, we're talking about the ancient wider world. We've forgotten actually that we're only talking about a very small part of it. And I put my hand up to this as someone who in 2014 published a book called Delphi, Center of the Ancient World. <laughs> <laughs> we have chosen almost arbitrarily to cut off and thus ignore clear evidence of the connections between the Mediterranean world and the interdependence of the Mediterranean world on the wider worlds of Asia, India, and China. That led, that realization, if you like, led to my book, Ancient Worlds, uh, in 2016. It led to the Levy Hume Research Fellowship that David mentioned. And it's now led to uh, an undergraduate module that I'm teaching this year in ancient global history. The only module of its kind in any classics or history department in any university in the UK. And that, I say, is a tribute to the students who are taking this module, some of whom are with us tonight. Brave brave souls right? <laughs> <laughs> who have blown me away across the course of this year with their eagerness to learn about different ancient cultures, the connections, their connections with the ancient Mediterranean, and to take on the challenge of doing so. This morning, we were having student presentations in ancient global history class, everything from pets across the ancient world to the move, why didn't Buddhism spread west as well as spreading east? through to how do we understand comparisons between Vedic religion of India and ancient Greece. I have been absolutely stunned by what you have all achieved. What do we get out of this kind of study uh, at undergraduate and indeed at research level? This is the world that I believe we should be looking at. Well, I think the first thing we get out of it is a reminder that the Greeks and Romans did not exist in isolation. Indeed, much of their major achievements were only possible due to their connectivity as part of this wider world. If we zoom in for a moment and realize that it was uh, in the first century CE that Romans worked out how to sail with the monsoon winds across the Indian Ocean 
to get to the major ports of India here. As a result, soon after, a fleet of something like 120 ships a year were leaving from their Egyptian ports of the Roman Empire, coming down and across. Eastern commerce grew sixfold during the reign of the first Roman Emperor, Augustus. Goods coming back were taxed twice. The Romans did taxation very well. Right? <laughs> they taxed stuff coming back when it first arrived here and then taxed it again when it left Alexandria to go to the Mediterranean. And where goods were going out to India, they taxed them here first and then again there before they left. Right? We have an amazing papyrus surviving called the Mudziris Papyrus that dates to the second century CE. Mudziris is here. This is the port of Miziris down in the Tamil Kingdom area of southern India. And Miziris Papyrus talks about a financial agreement for one ship, one ship making its journey from the Egyptian ports of the Roman Empire to Miziris and back. Its cargo was valued at nine million sesterces, when the property qualification to be a senator in Rome was 1.2 million. The sums we are talking about here are huge. And Roman economists have calculated, difficult as it may be, but the expense budget of the Roman Empire by the first and second centuries CE was something like 900 million sesterces, and the total tax that the Roman Empire seems to have been getting from this eastern trade with India comes in at something like 600 million sesterces. Actually, most of the great expansionist achievements of the Roman Empire would not probably have been possible without that financial money, that financial sum coming in from that eastern trade that we too often conveniently forget. I also think we get a much stronger appreciation for the realities of how connections are forged and maintained between different cultures in antiquity. Here, let's move to the east, to Han China, or to Qin and Han China of the third centuries BCE, who only really began exporting their prime goods, silk, that we so associate them with outside of China in large quantities as part of an appeasement arrangement, the He Qin arrangement, to appease the nomadic tribes to the north, particularly the Xiongnu, who agreed in return not to invade them quite as much. <laughs> as a result, Xiongnu burials at places like Noin Ulla, that dates to 13 CE, they are dripping in silk, from their boots to their bodies to the lining of their coffins. Here you see two pieces of silk that have just been indiscriminately sewn together just because. And you see a sum at the top there in 89 BCE where something like 92,000 meters of silk were being sent every year along with a Chinese princess to the Chongnu rulers uh, to uh, make sure they didn't invade too much. What did the Chongnu do with this excess that they couldn't possibly use for themselves? They traded it on and as a result the Silk Roads began. And it leaves the Han Chinese very uncertain about their place in the world. The situation of the empire may be described just like a person hanging upside down. The sun and heaven, the son of heaven, the Chinese emperor, the head of the world at the top, the vassal, the foot at the bottom. But now the Xiongnu are arrogant and insolent on the one hand and invade and plunder us on the other, which must be considered an act of extreme disrespect towards us. And the harm they've been doing to the empire is boundless. Yet each year, Han provides them with money, silk floss and fabric. To command the barbarian is the power vested in the emperor at the top, and to present tribute to the son of heaven is a ritual to be performed by vassals at the bottom. Now the feet are put at the top and the head at the bottom. Hanging upside down like this is something beyond comprehension. That's the beginning of ancient global world trade, right there. And we know that as the Chinese got sense of the Roman Empire at the other end of this great trajectory, they sought to engage with them directly. As we see here in the Hu Han Shu, the book of the later Han, 97 CE, first century, end of the first century AD, Gan Ying was sent to reach the place they called Da Qin. He reached Tiara Zi next to a large sea. We put it here, basically he gets to here, area of Messina. But the sailors of the western frontier of Anxi Parthia said to him, the ocean is huge. Those making the round trip, you can do it in three months if the winds are favorable, but if you encounter winds that delay you, if it can take two years, and that's why all the men go to store, go to sea with stores for at least three. The vast ocean urges men to think of their country and get homesick and some of them die. And when Gan Ying heard this, he gave up on his plan and turned back and went home. Little did he know, and the Parthians certainly didn't tell him, he just had to go there. 
And it happens again uh, to uh, the Chinese when they try again later. They say the king of this country talking about Rome constantly desires to have diplomatic relations with us. But the Parthians, wanting to be the only traders of Chinese silks, oppose this plan and set up obstacles so that there can be no personal communication with China. We see so many reflections of modern trading agreements, problems, interactions, difficulties, some of which we might be vaguely familiar with, with Brexit, uh, kind of here writ large in the very earliest phases of gathering global connectivity. I also think from this kind of study, we get an understanding of the complex ways in which different communities form perceptions of others, both near and far. This is what the Han thought about the Romans. Their kings are not permanent. If there are unexpected calamities in the kingdom, he is unceremoniously rejected and replaced. Sounds about fair. The ones who have been dismissed quietly accepts his demotion and is not angry. Absolute balderdash. <laughs> the people of this country are tall and honest. They resemble the people of the Middle Kingdom. They resemble us. Right? And that is why this kingdom is called Da Qin, Great China. We have a world here in which the Han are almost putting onto the Da Qin, the Romans, those that they never quite make direct contact with, an almost idealized version of what they want their own society to be, in which their own rulers, when they lose the mandate of heaven and the power to rule, would quietly and happily go off into the sunset rather than clinging onto power, um, in which they, uh, the Darchinians, are equally as tall and honest as us. And what do the Romans think about the Han? Well, here we have some different quotes, the Ceres, as they're known to the Romans. The Ceres, the silk people, they're known through their major good that comes to the Roman world. That comes, there. That, they, they as a people, come between the two, the Indians and the Scythians. They're a race eminent for integrity and well known for the trade that they allow to be transacted behind their backs, leaving their wares in a desert spot. Or as Pliny puts it, so manifold is the labor, so distant are the regions of the globe drawn upon to enable the Roman maiden to flaunt transparent clothing in public. Damn that silk, damn it, right? <laughs> It makes our women naked, right? and they want it. Everyone seems to want it. But the Ceres are of inoffensive manners, yet resemble wild animals, in that they shun all intercourse with the rest of mankind and await the approach of those who wish to traffic with them. The Romans have an odd relationship in that they really quite distrust and yet love and are addicted to the main good that comes from the Ceres, the silk people. And yet the Ceres themselves are not blamed for this. In fact, they seem to have a sort of almost primitive uh, way of interacting and trading. What we also get are some amazing moments in which mistakes change the course of history, or rather bargains that pay off change the course of history. In 166, uh, supposedly three Roman ambassadors turned up at the court of the Chinese emperor to offer elephant tusks, rhinoceros horn, and turtle shell, claiming to have come on behalf of the Roman emperor, recorded in the Chinese sources as being uh, named Amdun, kind of like Marcus Aurelius, kind of. But the tribute, the Chinese looked at this, went, well, that is rubbish. <laughs> elephant tusks, rhinoceros horn, we've got tons of that. We thought you guys had gold and pearls and jewels and everything amazing. Frankly, you're not worth trying to make an attempt to meet and get to anymore. And we don't, for the Chinese never, after this point, make another attempt to directly make contact with the Romans. What would have happened if those traders, who weren't from the Roman Emperor at all, they were three local traders chancing it? Kind of, what if they'd come with better goods? Or as Philostratus reminds us, uh, again, in the, his life of Apollonius of Tyana, Apollonius was a strict moral figure, a philosopher, and he was trying to cross the borders uh, between the Roman and uh, Parthian worlds here at the place of Zeugma. And he got asked by a tax collector what to declare what he was taking out of the country. He said, I have nothing to declare except my virtues, grace, faith, and charity. The tax collector handed him a bill for three high-end courtesans. It never pays to be a smart ass with the Border Patrol. 
my tribute here has to go to colleagues who are kind of in our department who are also breaking the boundaries of classics and its traditional study in lots of ways. We have a, a center of research in Greco Arabic studies. Elena Justi is leading a module on Africa and the makings of classical literature. We're one of the only classics departments in the UK that insists students learn about the Hellenistic world when things go massive um, and take in everything all the way to the borders of Asia and India. This kind of research, alongside and in conjunction with the ongoing analysis of Greek and Roman cultures in and of themselves, not only offers new and important avenues for investigation, but crucially, for both academics and students, offers a fresh perspective on their study. And for a generation of students whose futures are going to be, if anything, more global, it develops their global competency, their appreciation of cultural difference, and in my view, their ability to join us in a fight against the misuse of the ancient world. Now, classics is inherent, inherently always an interdisciplinary subject, right? We study everything from literature to coins to column drums to give us a full understanding of the ancient world. But we should be even more interdisciplinary in the years to come. And I don't just mean in terms of expanding our geographical remits. We also need to think about how we can bring vastly different research specialisms to bear on our topic. I'd say I thoroughly enjoy this kind of research. And I've recently been working as part of a broader research project um, on bringing the latest advances in the understanding of cognition. Here's, this is interdisciplinarity personified here. Uh, the, our understanding of cognition to bear on ancient religious experience. Um, I've been sitting there in the British Library trying to read articles from the journals of social cognition, autoimmunity review, principles of cognitive neuroscience, the psychological bulletin, and I've realized we're certainly not in Kansas anymore, Toto, <laughs> trying to, as a result, get to grip on what it was like to be part of an ancient religious festival such as this at the Sanctuary of Eleusis, which, while a mystery cult, was one of the most important public cults in ancient Athens. Now, as my students have been finding this year with global history, finding yourself in a new area of study is both exhilarating and terrifying, especially since... I think we always have in the backs of our minds the worry that our work may be dismissed by experts in one field or another, or indeed by people in our own field who don't feel that looking over the parapet into other worlds enriches our original topic of study. Now, these uh, attitudes towards interdisciplinary work are well entrenched because of traditional departmental and disciplinary boundaries, and to overturn them requires the development of the necessary support to enable academics to venture into new worlds of study on uh, and cross those boundaries, not just occasionally, not just for short ventures, but on a more permanent basis. And we have, both at Warwick and nationally, via the main research and funding bodies, got better at providing that support in terms of encouragement of these efforts, their recognition as serious academic endeavors, and in the provision of funding and academic structures to enable, house, and support them. But one example made me realize that we still have quite a way to go. This international academic fellowship from a funder that shall remain nameless, uh, which is for established researchers to develop new knowledge, skills, and ideas in one or more research centers outside the UK. Sounds great. Look to line three. We'll support you in, air quotes, discipline hopping excursion. La, 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 la. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's skipping, isn't it? My three-year-old won't kind of think. Um, kind of, the air quotes, what are we doing here in terms of discipline hopping in excursions? Kind of excursion, is this a short holiday somewhere? Or is this a kind of jungle expedition? Right? We don't even yet have the language fixed to be able to describe what we want to be able to achieve. But the breaking of such boundaries is not only something we have to do in terms of our research and the topics that we teach, but equally importantly, in how we teach. Now, this is something, as David alluded to, I'm equally passionate about alongside many of my colleagues in classics. We are proud that we are a department that may be studying the most ancient material in the university, but we're also most often breaking frontiers in the most modern and up-to-date technology to enable us to do so. Classics is regularly using the most technological spaces this university has to offer, working with the fabulous academic technologists and e-learning gurus we have here to create cutting edge resources to deploy in our teaching and research. And we're supported in that by institutions like we're here and IATL. The thing I love most about this university is that if you've got an idea about how to do things differently, the answer most often is, well, why not? Let's give it a try. 
And here we do in kind of a numerous ways, whether it be in uh, carving our own inscriptions, putting on our plays, bringing VR into the classroom, or indeed in recreating an ancient Greek drinking party with Ribena, not wine, I promise. <laughs> Here we got replicas of ancient Greek drinking vessels made. We move into the teaching grid for flexible space. There were a few concerns about what we were gonna do. That's why we had to put the plastic sheeting down. <laughs> and then we get students to take up the position of the symposium and try to drink from these vessels. And then just to add insult to injury, we video them up close and project <laughs> them onto a screen as well. So that this now mainstay of our first year experience, these students actually get to live and understand, live the ancient Greek symposium and understand how the vessels and images on them would have been experienced uh, in, uh, in the round and at that time. Now such innovative teaching I think not only improves the student experience and student learning, but also pays off in terms of promoting new research questions for academics to answer. You may notice there's a bucket here, that is a modern bucket, you'll be pleased to know, here we have it, but inside it, resting inside it is this. This is a sphincter. It was used to put a wine in, a cold water inside, and then you dump that in a larger crater, nicely represented here by our, buttock, uh, our bucket <laughs> of wine. I need a glass of wine, or maybe I've had one, it sounds like already, uh, to cool it down. But until we started doing this, we didn't realize that when you put this cold vessel inside the warmer wine, it starts to rotate and turn. 2D images that get represented like this in books turn into 3D moving film. And that sent me off to find someone who knows something about fluid dynamics. Anyone know anything about fluid <laughs> dynamics? We often talk about research-led teaching, but for me, this is an example of innovative teaching-led research that prompts new questions and inherently interdisciplinary approaches. Teaching students in this way is gonna end up teaching me something which I would never have come to in any other way and which hopefully then I can pass on and communicate to the wider field. But if we're gonna be breaking boundaries in what we teach, how we teach it, then for me it's also crucial that we break boundaries in who we teach and engage with. By this I refer, of course, to the important work universities are doing in widening participation to ensure people from all backgrounds are not only supported to apply in the first place, through the application process, and then to make sure they're supported through their studies. But it also refers to the way in which the university does not just do communication, but meaningful public engagement, the creation of an ongoing two-way dialogue with local, national, and international audiences. Now, widening participation and public engagement are especially important to a subject like classics that has fought hard over the last two decades in particular to shake off its elitist connotations and improve access to the study of the ancient world in schools across the country. But it's also, I think, never been more important for universities in an era in which universities face intense public scrutiny over their value for money, transparency, accountability, and purpose. Now in classics, I've been proud to work with students and colleagues in the department across the university and with different bodies across the country on a range of different initiatives under the WP and PE banners. We have, uh, and here they are too, uh, kind of between the two of them. Uh, in terms of our drama festival, one of the mainstays of our classics department calendar in which uh, undergraduate students come together to put on a performance in the Arts Center and we bring then lectures around that from members of staff and students come from across the country. It's now the largest public engagement event in the Faculty of Arts calendar. You can see the latest video of the play just uploaded a couple of days ago and you too can learn how to chorus like a group of ancient Greek frogs. <laughs> Back a coquette. But also in conjunction with advocating classics education and classics for all, we brought into being, as David mentioned, the Warwick Classics Network, supported financially by Warwick Widening Participation and Warwick Impact, as well as now by the National Charity Classics for All. And here we are to support the introduction and expansion of ancient world studies in state schools in Coventry, the West Midlands, as well as spearheading the creation of national resources for the teaching of these subjects. And it's great that some of those teachers can be with us here this evening. And at the same time, 
It's my pleasure and pride to be uh, president of the Lytham St. Anne's Classical Association up in the northwest of the country, some of which of you are here and made the journey down this evening. This is, since it was begun five years ago, now the largest branch of the Classical Association in the entire country, set up by the youngest person to establish a branch of the Classical Association since 1903. And it is a group that not only provides a series of lectures for people interested in the ancient world, but spends time, energy, and money actively fundraising to enable students with bursaries to go on and attend summer schools to enhance and increase their chances of being able to study classics at a further level than at university. Engaging with the public for me is a fundamental part of what being an academic is all about. Not just about why we think this is an interesting subject, but also, as we saw at the beginning of the lecture, to get involved in the debate over how and what these ancient worlds were really like, and thus what they can and cannot be used to mean and substantiate. Now, as such, I've always said, uh, spent a percentage of my time writing books and articles for public audiences, as well as presenting TV documentaries about the ancient world. The advantages for me is I get to see parts of the ancient world I would never otherwise have the chance to do. Although increasingly, that seems to mean them handing me a safety harness and making me abseil down a very deep hole. <laughs> After the first program we did in, in this round, Invisible Rome, uh, in, where I spent quite a lot of time in the drains under Rome, I got a letter from Thames Water. And they said, you look like a man who likes a good sewer. Would you like to come on a tour of the London sewers? It's very interesting, actually. <laughs> But equally also, through some of the technology that gets employed in these programs, particularly the laser scanning and the virtual reality, that allows us to occupy spaces in the ancient world that we can't do in reality. I would never, ever, ever get permission to stand on the steps of the Eretheum Caryatid porch, right, of the real one, but I can do in virtual reality, uh, and to imagine the world as the ancient Greeks may have seen it. And just last week, we heard from Pearl Hyde Primary School in Coventry, where years three and four children, so aged seven to nine, have been using VR headsets that were lent to them by Warwick University through the Warwick Classics Network to be able to engage with the VR experiences that were created by the BBC as part of this recent series, Ancient Invisible Cities, to be able to start to get to grips with the ancient Greek and indeed Egyptian worlds. With the result that, they are now utterly enthused about the ancient world, right? and particularly, I hope, the Greek rather than the Egyptians. <laughs> but I also believe this kind of work can spark ideas for study at an academic level. I did a series about luxury back in 2011 that led, got me thinking about how we haven't really understood the complex nature of luxury in the ancient Greek world, which Edith here and Paul here were part of as well. And equally, I have to confess that my first kind of light bulb moment about doing more global history came from doing a Radio 4 series called Spin the Globe, where we looked at what else was going on around the world at particularly famous dates in time when you know about one thing happening in one place, but what happens elsewhere. But I've realized also that over the past decade of doing this, that the, that engagement is at its most satisfying and its most potent when it's also part of a two-way dialogue. And as such, whenever uh, my TV and radio documentaries go out, I'm going to be live tweeting alongside to answer people's questions, as well as engaging more widely over social media and through website feedback questionnaires. And there's one coming for you at the end of this lecture. <laughs> and also, more recently, I've begun uh, my weekly Facebook Live Q&A session. Is that, a, is that a, a V? I've got five minutes, or I should? Sh I've got five minutes. That's not a V. Sit down, right, kind of. <laughs> Five minutes. In fact, you couldn't be better timed with the V because last Thursday when we did our last Q&A session was Valentine's Day. And so we decided to do a Valentine's themed Q&A. Except that meant I then, it was all actually inspired by Edith Hall who uh, told me that the day before Valentine's Day over Twitter was International Condom Day. And uh, there are certain brands of condom that have taken their inspiration from the ancient world. Would you care to use a brand called Spartan? <laughs> or indeed, even worse in my view, Sphinx, my kind of. <laughs> anyway, that led to me blushing terribly as I was asked on live Q&A to explain what does exactly Aristophanes' description of the sexual position lioness on a cheese grater really mean? 
And tonight, we are broadcasting live this inaugural via Facebook. Hello, everyone. Wave. Nice to see you to a global audience. And we're going to be taking some questions, hopefully, from that global audience as part of the Q&A. We are literally breaking through the boundaries of the university so that everyone with an internet connection can be part of this debate and discussion. And I believe that that two-way dialogue with the wider world should be at the heart of what we do in the university, and that we need to champion not only the ways in which the wider community and universities benefit from that dialogue, but how it can feed back positively into our teaching and to our research. And I think we need to be involving our students more in the process. Right? I'm very proud to have been part of a classics department where undergraduates, postgraduates, and staff work together on outreach and engagement programs. This photo sums up, I think, more than anything, our department where you have head of departments, staff members, postgraduates, undergraduates, all celebrating our joint departmental victory uh, in the staff awards for public engagement last year. We've talked about the Drama Festival already, another moment where we come together as undergraduates, postgraduates, and staff to produce something extraordinary for the outside world. Our second years doing Hellenistic World have been producing digital stories, short films that go up on our Classics YouTube channel for the wider world to enjoy. As part of the Warwick Classics Network, we're soon going to be hosting a postgrad-led initiative day uh, for ancient images, modern eyes. And David referred to this as well, oiko.world, which brings together my interests in pushing the boundaries of academic research, linking up with the Warwick academic technologists and indeed to external uh, technological firms and computer, computer minds, the geniuses who are able to actually do the coding as I faff my hands in the air going, I want something a bit like this. Supported by Warwick impact funds to create a public facing portal for engagement with ancient global history. And now in 2018-19, the students of the Ancient Global History module have just finished an assessment where they have been uh, adding to this project, right? creating new data in this system that is going to be out there for the public to enjoy. Now that, in a nutshell, is what I hope for academia, for universities, for degree study, and in particular for classics, that we move towards a system in which we are fully supported in bursting through the boundaries uh, inherent in our subject, bursting through and breaking through those boundaries in how we teach it and to whom we teach it, in which the continual three-way mutual dialogue between research, teaching, and engagement is recognized and put at the heart of what we do as academics, and in which students of all stages and from all backgrounds work alongside us as academics in our mission, not only to discover and understand the past, but to communicate that past to people of all ages in the wider world and challenge its use and its misuse in order not only to prepare better our students for the myriad of careers they're going to go on to do, but also to help ensure that we better harness the power of the past to enrich the world that we're all going to live in in the future. Thank you very much indeed.